Story Warren Books presents Prince Lander and the Dragon War Tales of Old Natalia, Book 3 by S.D. Smith Narrated by Eric Fritschews I saw the young prince fall at the edge of our camp. I know the dragon king's own blade carried his blood. We all mourned for him, but our king was ever after changed. We settled in to defend with all we had. I was there when the end really did come, when the fire we had feared threatened to consume all. In the end, it took so much, but I was gone when it took him. From the Journal of Massey Burnson Chapter 1 Prince Lander flanked his father as they trudged forward in the snow, headed toward a shameful treaty with their bitter enemies. Get me, Captain Massey! King Whitson Mariner shouted back to his trailing train of officers and soldiers, his eyes unfocused as he limped along. Captain Massey is gone, father, Prince Lander said darting a worried look back through the falling snow at his brothers, Lemuel and Grant. This was not the first time Father had asked for Captain Massey today. It's been weeks, sir. Of course, King Whitson replied slowly, shaking his head as they halted. I had forgotten a moment, son. Forgive me. It's nothing, Father, Lander replied, and he smiled as confidently as he was able to with honesty. It had been nearly two months since Dr. Grimes had told the family about King Whitson's affliction. Over time, the king would lose his power to think clearly. Before he reached old age, King Whitson's mind would waste away, and he would die. Grief washed over Lander as he laid his hand on his father's shoulder. Should we advance, sir? Lord Grimble will be waiting. King Whitson coughed, looked around anxiously then nodded. Grant, the brown-furred and barely of age fourth child of King Whitson and Queen Lily, crossed his arms and spat. He grumbled. If that oath-breaker Grimble somehow keeps his word this time. Lemuel, the short and slight-framed second-born, shook his head, with a pleading look in his eyes and a nervous glance back toward their camp. Lander shrugged. Prince Lander, the first-born son and heir to King Whitson, agreed with his brothers and shared their worries. How could they go against everything their father had done for years? How could they leave the camp? Lord Grimble wasn't to be trusted. He had proven that again and again. It had been many years since Grimble's first betrayal, back when Lander was only a child. But Lander was grown now a seasoned veteran and a heroic captain of their kind. King Whitson, with what strength of mind and body he had remaining, insisted he was aiming to build an alliance that could defend and hold out against the dragons before his own end came. Whitson believed it was imperative to unite all the fractured rabbits of Natalia to accomplish this seemingly impossible task. Whitson's war plan came down to this call. Defend all. All defend. Yes, Lander agreed with his brothers that Grimble, a treacherous rabbit lord who had an alliance with the dragons, was not to be trusted. However, he also agreed with his father that their own band wasn't strong enough to defend against the dragons on their own. A quandary. Grant clenched and unclenched his fist over his sword hilt, agitation plain on his face. Father, we absolutely cannot all go with you. We must keep a leader with a stronger force at camp. Lander sighed. He knew this wouldn't help. Are you king now, Grant? Whitson asked, his eyes flitting lazily around his senior officers. Do you wish... He paused, looking around in confusion for a moment, then continued. To argue yet again? Father, no, Grant said, hurrying up beside him. You are king, and I'm your servant. My son, Whitson corrected. My dear, 
dear son. Yes, father, Grant replied. I will follow you anywhere, of course. I'm not afraid to die, only... Only you're certain you know better than a dim-witted oldster who can't remember what day it is, or who is where half the time. No, father, Lander frowned. Get back now, Grant. Leave father to lead. You always say that, Grant hissed. But one day this will fall to you, or Lemuel, or me, and I don't want it to all be lost by then. Follow orders, Prince Grant, Lord Arben snapped. Lord Grimble was right about you. You're a hot-headed fool and are sure to wreck everything. Don't talk to him like that, Lemuel said, stepping forward as the officers and lords all spoke at once with raised angry voices. Whitson raised his hand for silence, then turned to his fourth-born son. Grant Whitson, my dear Buck. With an outstretched arm, he beckoned his son to him, then slowly hooked his arm around Grant's shoulders. You remind me of your grandfather. Lord Grant lived long on Golden Coast, and came here with me, his son-in-law, and followed me loyally every day of his life in Natalia. He died defending our folk when you were knee-high. He knew what it meant to be a noble, to act nobly. Lander hung his head. His grandfather Grant had been precious to him. His death was an enduring wound and turned Lander's heart to thoughts of revenge against Lord Grimble. Lord Grant had died fighting Grimble's oath-breaking faction, not the dragons. The dragons had killed Lander's brother Davis, yes but both died following father's uncompromising plan of defending their camp at all costs and with everything they had. Grant shrugged. Yes, father. Isn't it our duty to protect our own, as he did? Whitson wiped at his mouth, then nodded. What is the duty of a king? he asked. To serve, to do rightly, to be first into danger and last out to rule so that those under his rule are as free and good as they can possibly be. True. All of that is true. Whitson squeezed his son close, and his voice dropped lower. He must also inspire them to follow, if he can. He must invite them to follow, if he cannot inspire them. And if he can do neither, he must insist that they follow. Lander was close enough to hear. He saw Grant's eyes go from their father to the surrounding bucks, trusted officers and armed soldiers, many of whom had fought by Whitson's side since the beginning of his voyage. Understanding dawned on Grant. He closed his eyes and exhaled. Forgive me, father. I will close my mouth and keep my place. It may comfort you to know this, Whitson whispered just loud enough for Lander to hear. I have laid a trap for Grimble. You see, son, we have a traitor among our innermost counselors. I had to confirm some suspicions. Grant's eyes grew wide. If I have ruined that plan, father, I am mortified. Oh, father, I am so sorry. Whitson smiled. You have not ruined it, son, he whispered. You have carried it out. Grant cocked his head sideways, and his mouth fell open, a perplexed expression on his face. But Lander smiled, his heart flooding with relief. He knows who the spy is. Prince Lander, Whitson said, turning swiftly. Please arrest Lord Arben and Captain Danker. We do aim to make a treaty with Grimble, if he will see sense. But we will not be spied upon by him in the meantime. Lander nodded toward Captain Wren. The captain and four of his bucks in the king's royal guard surrounded the traitors. Lander stepped forward. I arrest you in the name of the king on suspicion of treason. You are making a treaty with Grimble, your majesty, Lord Arbin shouted. It is not treason to merely converse with an ally. So you admit it, Whitson snapped 
seeming sharper than he had in weeks. It is certainly treason to scheme with the king's enemies against him. It is certainly treason to conspire against your king. You know Grimble isn't keeping faith, and yet you aid him. Drop your swords, Lander said, leveling his blade at Lord Arben's neck. Lord Arben didn't move, but Captain Danker slowly drew and dropped his blade. The weapon vanished beneath the snow, leaving a sword-shaped gash. Did you not suppose, King Whitson asked, stepping forward, that if Grimble had a spy in my midst, I might have a spy in his? Did you not think that I might suspect you when you insisted that every senior officer and the bulk of our forces come to this treaty summit? Did you not think I would suspect when you inquired where the Queen might be? He has stolen my lily once with the aid of his dragon masters. I tell you today that he never shall again. Captain Danker fell to his knees and began babbling, begging forgiveness and promising to tell all. You old fool! Lord Arben screamed, stepping forward. You've lost your mind. You'll lose this war and lose all. We must make peace with the dragons, as Lord Grimble has, or else flee these lands forever. Whitson stepped closer and eyed him coldly. Never. Lord Arben's eyes grew wild, and he reached for his sword. Prince Lander's foot flashed out, kicking Arben's wrist hard. The furious buck opened his mouth to harangue the king further, but Prince Lander's open hand swiftly shot out to level the lord with a humiliating blow. The slap stunned him into silence. Lander growled, Take this traitor away! As Lord Arben and Captain Denker were dragged off, King Whitson nodded to Lemuel. Take Captain Cove and find out what they know. Prince Lemuel nodded and, together with Captain Cove, hurried after the king's guards and their prisoners. Their crunching footfalls faded as the officers restored order. Well done, your majesty, Captain Walters said, crossing to bow to the king. We go to war on many fronts, Whitson replied, shaking hands with Walters. I did truly long for a treaty with Grimble, of course, but I never thought it likely. We shall have to hope for aid from another place. Shall I reform our usual defense, your majesty? Walters asked. At once, if you please, Captain, the king replied. Until help comes, we must defend all, and all must defend. What if Massey never returns? Grant asked. Are you still so full of doubts, my son? Grant winced. Forgive me, father. I feel I am always about to let you down with my foolishness. You feel, Grant, Whitson said. And that is your great strength and weakness. Feeling without thought is wild, but thought without feeling is not alive. Keep being alive, son. Lander shook his head at Grant. Maybe one day you'll be alive long enough to grow a brain. Grant held up his hands, accepting the jibe. There was noise through the ranks and Lander gazed down the long train of soldiers till he saw a messenger making his way up the line. He sagged onto a snowbank, then staggered ahead, leaning on the helping arms of soldiers along the way. This might be bad, Lander groaned. We are at war, Grant said, so even my tiny brain knows this isn't good. Lander stepped between the stumbling messenger and the king. The young rabbit bowed, the badly bandaged gash on his head bleeding freely. If you please, your highness, a report. Go ahead, soldier. We were ambushed, sir. I was the only one to get away. Medic, Lander shouted, as the injured messenger fell to his knees. There, son, Lander whispered, taking the young buck's bleeding head in his hands as the soldier stepped closer. We're going to get you taken care of, soldier. Your highness the messenger said, tears in his eyes. Grimble's faction are doing it again. They're trading half their younglings to renew their alliance with the dragons. 
Lander's chest tightened, and he felt a sickening constriction in his throat. When, he growled. At dawn, my lord, the messenger whispered hoarsely. Then his eyes rolled back as he collapsed fully into the prince's arms. Chapter 2 Hours later, as darkness fell fully, Prince Lander's raft landed on the edge of Grimble Island. As he scrambled off the raft, his leg dragged in the icy river. Suppressing a cry, he rubbed vigorously at the leg, freeing his fur of most of the freezing water. But it had soaked into his foot wrapping, undoing its intended protection. Worse things than cold feet will happen if I don't hurry on. Shivering, he glanced back to see Captain Walters on the other shore, his rounded belly standing out in a moonlit silhouette. He stood ready to launch his larger boats when signaled. Lander pulled the raft onto the beach and crept ahead. He had expected sentinels. He had prepared for them. Bow in hand and quiver bouncing gently behind him, he ran along the crunching snow to the cover of the tree line and crouched low. Peering through the darkness and the falling snow, he saw no signs of Grimble's soldiers. He ran ahead, knowing the way from careful study of the map. And, of course, he had been here before. Years ago, Captain Grimble had taken his fallen father's place as lord and leader of the Grimble faction. Oathbreakers is how Lander and his larger community of loyalist rabbits thought of them. Lander hadn't come onto the island itself since then, but he had been through a harrowing adventure there with Captain Massey the day they first discovered the dragons and rescued Queen Lily. Now the dragons had given the island to Lord Grimble and only reserved their sacred pool at its center for their dark rituals. Grimble's faction ruled the island, often allying with the Dragon King's army to defend it from incursions by King Whitson's loyalist forces. Lander peered into the forest, now caked with snow, and recognized where he must go. He began to walk, his wrapped feet sinking into the deepening snow. A sound from behind startled him, and he darted for a snow-covered bush. Steps! Closer and closer. Lander sprang up and leveled a knocked arrow at a creeping form. Your Highnessness, the shrouded shape whispered through a muffled mask. Identify, Lander snapped. I'm Nickel, he said, open hands out to show they were free of weapons. Here, your Royal H, to see that ye are not killed. Lander lowered his bow, recognizing the lanky form of Nickel Drecker. What's wrong with you? You're jeopardizing a mission here, young Nickel. Who ordered you to follow me? I only ordered myself, your Highnessness, he said, shrugging. That's not how this works, Lander hissed. Go back the way you came. Who then might have your back, sir? Nickel asked. I'm doing this alone, Lander explained, because it's not a job for a band. And I'm doing it alone so I don't have to guide an impertinent, inexperienced buck through the whole thing. Walters is my backup, and I planned... Listen, I don't need to explain this to you. I need you to follow orders. I will, to be sure, my good prince and lord. But if ye will indulge me just one last question, did ye spot them two archers in yon high nests ahead? What? Lander spun and ducked down, gazing up through the thickening fall of snow. They'll be waiting, sir, Nickel said, for ye to do what ye were about to do. Just clamber through that clearing and right into their trap. Lander scanned the trees and finally spotted them, two archers hidden high with a commanding view of the clearing. His heart dropped. He would be dead were it not for Nickel's intervention. In his anger and eagerness, he had rushed ahead foolishly. Maybe I'm not so different from Grant. Nodding his thanks to Nickel, Lander remembered the strange skill set of this young soldier. He was a little mouthy and in trouble often, yes, 
but he also had an uncanny ability with a sling. He and a few of his cousins were actually training a cohort of soldiers in this archaic craft, passed down from his ancestors. Nickel also wore a unique shield on his back, narrow at the bottom but widening at the top, and plated in metal. Lander had to acknowledge that for all his problems, Nickel was an effective soldier. You can stay, Nickel, but follow my lead, and don't talk. Of course, Inus. I barely say a word ever, anyways. I'm a quiet sort of feller, and modest as a tottering old codger what's lost his chompers. Nickel, Lander snapped. Be quiet. Ay, my lord, Nickel replied, placing a hand over his mouth. But do speak up, Lander amended, and point out any time I'm about to be killed. Nickel bowed with a playful flourish of his right hand and, sliding the long shield from his back, crossed to the prince's side. Lander raised his bow, sighting the distant archer nestled in the high tree on the left. You ready, Nickel? Aye, sir, he replied, setting a carved stone in his sling. Ready to roar! Lander rose and fired. A screaming curse sounded from the high tree, followed by a falling form. An arrow raced at Lander, but Nickel lunged, and his shield deflected it away. Lander pivoted, knocked another shaft, and fired in a swift motion as he reloaded again. The arrow missed, and the enemy rabbit began scrambling down the tree. Lander sprang ahead. Plowing through the snow, Lander heard Nickel's swift steps behind him. The younger buck soon dashed past him and quickly closed on the sentinel. Lander squinted against the snow and saw the enemy trudge through a wind-blown snowdrift, driving ever closer to Grimble's camp, where he would give the alarm. When Nickel reached the snowdrift, he didn't slow down for a second, but leapt over it with seeming ease. He landed in a small clearing and set his sling swinging. The agile weapon whirled as the young buck sped along. The enemy was about to disappear into the forest when Nickel let loose his stone. The rock raced ahead, and, just as the fleeing guard swiveled back to check his pursuit, struck him hard. He fell, feet flying into the air in a sliding wreck that shaped a long trench in the snow. Lander jogged up, breathing hard, and found Nickel bent over the fallen form. Did you get him? Oi, sir, Nickel said. He'll trouble us no more, nor them young ones below, if ye and me have our say tonight. Prince Lander nodded and, breathing hard, paused on the rocky edge of a precipice. The settlement below was laid out just as their spy had said. A large barn stood on the far side of the town, the one in which they kept the younglings penned on such horrific nights. This was the cost of Grimble's grotesque alliance with King Namaz, Lord of Dragons. One concern I have is that these younglings won't want to come with us if they realize who we are, Lander said. They've been trained to hate Whitson's loyalists since birth, and them wretched malefactors will have no doubt told them kids nothing about what their fate is. We have to save them, Lander said. We can't let them go to the dragons. Behind them, a rising noise, fast, crunching footfalls approached. Chapter 3 Lander spun, knocking an arrow in an instant. Your Highnessness, old, Nickel said, stepping in front of the aimed arrow. I'm next to certain these midnight marauders are me own band. Lander sighed lowering the bow and spinning back to check the fortified town below the cliff on which they stood. There was a clearing on their left, and a long stone stairway leading down to a wall surrounding the town. Your own band? Oi that! Nickel whistled a rhythmic repeating tune. It came back to him with an answering flourish from the trees behind them. That'll be me sister. Your sister? Lander winced and shook his head. Send her back! 
Nickel shrugged. Very headstrong, that one. Must run in the family. Nickel shrugged again, then spun to greet his sister, who jogged up with a carefree smile and open arms. Behind her followed five more bucks, no doubt all related to the odd twins. Lander recognized her. Winnie Drecker was her name, and she was as troublesome as her brother, but both were among the friendliest of their odd clan. Lander believed she might be some kind of inventor, but he wasn't certain. The five bucks were silent and wore bemused expressions. A large number of their semi-nomadic band had come to Natalia with Whitson, but the Dreckers had a complicated history with the old kings and community of Golden Coast. That continued in Natalia. The four major places in the long history of rabbit kind were well known. Their mythology began on Immovable Mountain, the place left by Flint and Fay when they and the Leapers crossed to Blue Moss Hills. From Blue Moss Hills, long years later, the trekkers journeyed for many years until they finally found Golden Coast. When centuries after that, Golden Coast was threatened with invasion and annihilation, Whitson Mariner and a host of survivors took to the seas. They sailed in a vast company of ships across the sea to Natalia, where they now strove for a home. Prince Lander, King Whitson, and Queen Lily's first child had been born in Natalia. Nickel and Winnie's family were part of a group called the Dead Trekkers, usually now shortened to Drekkers, a community that came to Golden Coast many years after the original Trekkers who made the long voyage from Blue Moss Hills. They had been assumed dead, so when they showed up hundreds of years later at the thriving kingdom of Golden Coast, they found an uneasy welcome, and the separate cultures clashed. Lander's father had told him many stories of the Drekkers' odd interactions with old King Gerard and the Lords. Nickel and Winnie's parents, along with dozens of other Drekkers, had joined the voyagers fleeing Golden Coast with Whitson Mariner, but they had maintained a kind of independent culture among those loyal rabbits. Many thought they might join with Grimble's Oathbreakers, but the Drekkers had so far kept faith with Whitson. Nickel Drecker nodded to Winnie. Sister, ye well? Ay, well, Winnie replied. Is your highness, she said, bowing quickly to Prince Lander. Her band followed her and bowed their short bows. Winnie Drecker, Lander said, keeping his voice level. You and your band must return to the mainland and then get back to the village. Ay, sir, she replied. But may I ask ye just one teensy-weensy question first? She didn't wait for his response. Suppose we had a scheme that'd keep ye alive, and added to that would help ye save them poor younglings yonder this cold night. Lander turned his head and gazed at the trees, expecting another ambush thwarted. Seeing nothing, he sighed and turned back. I suppose I would listen to that before you left? But the moon is rising soon, and we have to hurry. What's your scheme? Winnie laughed. I don't have no scheme, Highness, but Nickel have ten. Nickel smiled and nodded. Eight for now, but give me two shakes, and I'll have ye three more. That's eleven, that, said one of the cousins. Nickel laughed. Promise them coal and deliver them gold. Lander frowned. Is that an old Drekker saying handed down from centuries past? No, Nickel replied. I've just come out with it. But it'll go the other way round now and get remembered for centuries hence ahead. Or, Winnie put in, forgotten tomorrow's the more like. Nickel shook his head. She's been this way since infancy, that one. Doubting the enduring quality of me pithy wisdom. It's a load on me mind, sure. About them eleven schemes, Winnie said. Lander gazed at the horizon. We just need one, but we need it soon. It's one hour till this place gets a lot brighter. Nickel nodded. I'll start with me worst. Then ye will have arranged to... 
Lender held up a hand. Start with your best nickel. Aye, sir, he replied. I hope ye like it. It's a trick. An hour later, Lander watched from the other side of the town, while the moon rose behind the cliffside they had just left. Nickel and Winnie looked over at Lander, eyes wide with a question. Lander glanced across the valley and saw fifty forms perched on the illuminated horizon. The moon glowed behind the cliffside forms and shone into the town the Grimbles had built, with its forts and mills, watchtowers and houses. The houses were spare. Many were mere hovels. Lander again spied the watchtower, its bell outlined high in its top, where strangely no guard watched. The prince nodded and Nickel nodded back, then passed the nod on to his sister and their cousins down the line. Lander rose and aimed an arrow, remembering his training from Captain Massey. Where are you now, Captain? He fired at the tower bell, and it struck with an echoing peal. Rocks from loosed slings rained down on rooftops, and the eight rabbits hidden on the rim of town began shouting wildly. Soon the town's rabbits rushed from forts and homes, tripping into the lanes and grabbing for weapons. They gazed up at the hillside, where the hidden rabbits' shouts echoed off the rock and seemed to originate. Outlined against the moon, the forms of rabbit warriors stood poised in attack, with terrible weapons ready to wreak havoc. The Grimble soldiers, mustering in haste and charging up the hill, didn't have the clarity to pause and watch the frozen forms. They didn't see, until they were upon the would-be attackers on the moonlit ridge, that the rabbit soldiers they attacked were stationary. They were harmless, made of snow. Meanwhile. Lander and the Drecker twins rushed over the wall and into the town. They darted for the nearby barn that served as the holding pen for the children set aside for the dragons. Throwing over the large wooden beam barring the door, they charged inside. The frightened children huddled along the far wall. Winnie and Lander called out orders. This way, younglings! In front of the frightened crowd, an older child, nearly of age, stood with her arms out and fists clenched in front of the others. I know what you're doing, she shouted. I know about the bargain with the dragons. I'll fight you. When Lander reached them, his hands open and outstretched, she threw a fast jab at his stomach. Caught off guard, he felt the blow hit home. He coughed and reached for her. Look at us, Lander said. He grabbed her arms and forced her to look at his face. Do I look familiar? Does she? he asked, pointing at Winnie. Weeping now, it took her a few moments to stop and look. Still sobbing, but with a look of new fear in her eyes, she shook her head. Lander's voice was steady. We're from Whitson's army. She began thrashing away, but he held her tight. You have heard many lies about us, I'm sure. But look into my eyes and hear this. We pay no tribute to the dragons. We protect and cherish all our young. And we've come to rescue you. The young doe was speechless with confusion and fear, and her eyes darted between the strangers and the young she had vowed to protect. I, I, I... It's all right there, Winnie said. We got to get moving. Can ye help us lead these younger ones away? I see they look to ye. They trust ye. Ye could save them this night, if ye will only act fast. Lander thought he understood the possible story of how this older doe got in with these other very young ones. She had learned somehow of what the leaders planned. Indignant that her elders would turn over younglings to the dragons, she either defied them and was thrust in here with them, or she volunteered to join them and share their terrible fate. Either way, Lander admired her courage. But now she was struggling, and they were running out of time. The ruse on the hillside with the warrior snow rabbits would have been discovered by now. 
the Oathbreaker defenders, perhaps Lord Grimble himself, and his most deadly soldiers, would be rushing back to discover what mischief was afoot in their town. Part of Lander relished the confrontation. An agonizing memory of Grimble killing Lord Grant, Lander's own dear grandfather, was seared into his memory. I'd like a chance to settle that score. And many others. Shaking his head, he saw that Winnie was trying to help the young Doe understand, while Nickel crept to the edge of the crowd and calmed the most upset. Ye can lead these to safety with us, Winnie said. The young Doe fell to her knees, hands pressed over her mouth as her eyes grew wide with panic. She seemed trapped between two evil choices, and she was choking on the moment. Her breathing thickened and she sagged, but Lander held her up. He smiled at her. It's all right, dear. You're going to be okay, and so are all of them. What's your name? I'm Holly, she whispered. Holly Grimble. Chapter 4 Holly Grimble Grimble? Grimble? Lander stepped back, a sudden anger stirring in his chest. Come on now, Winnie said, pulling Holly to her feet. She turned to the prince. We best get gone, sir. Grimble? Lander glared at Holly a moment, then nodded. Let's go. Lander dashed out the open door, and Winnie, one hand gripping Holly's and the other waving for the rest to follow, hurried after him. Nickel, sling at the ready in one hand, nudged the last of the younglings to follow. Winnie turned. Ori now! Move and go! she called, clicking her tongue at them. All's gonna be good soon, if you'll hurry your bottoms on! They ran. Lander, recovering from his alarm at discovering he was rescuing his enemy's own daughter, stepped into the moonlit street. Angry shouts echoed from the ridge above, and noise swelled in nearby lanes. Nickel was leading the younglings over the wall, with the clever steps he'd hastily improvised half an hour before. Up and over the wall went the line of rescued young rabbits. Lander, his bow knocked and his heart racing, stood alongside a sling-wielding Winnie as they covered the escape. A backward glance told Lander that the last youngster was over, and he nodded for Winnie to follow. She spun and ran, bounding over the wall in two easy steps. Lander, a bit older and a lot more wary, took a more cautious approach, but both cleared the wall and, landing on the packed snow, found the party far up the hillside. The small ones were running, hurried on by Holly's encouragement. She had found her voice, and, though Lander could see in her backward glances that she was far from pleased to be in the company of Whitson's rabbits, she was making the best of their limited options, and helping the little ones move quickly. Soon they were deep into the forest and halfway to the shoreline. Safety loomed ahead. Oh! Holly cried. Lander jogged near enough to see a small buck, so young he hadn't been walking very long, collapse in the snow. Holly bent and tended to him, urging the others to hurry on and follow Nickel. Lander, stepping closer and darting glances back toward the town, slung his bow back over his shoulder. There's no time! Holly's face hardened. Then I'll stay here and die with him! She snapped back. Lander smiled and bent low, scooped up the buck and hurried ahead. Come on, Holly Grimble. We're leaving no one behind, not even you. Lander heard the crunch of snow behind them as Holly jogged on. Soon she passed him and rushed to help the last stragglers of the group keep up the grueling run. The last one, staggering a few steps, veered off the path and began to fall. Holly reached for her and soon was running again. In a few minutes, they had to slow their pace at the back of the line. Lander ordered Nickel to carry on up front with the fastest, while Winnie, Holly, and he urged on the slowest ones. Soon Lander was carrying three younglings, while Holly and Winnie bore two each. But they pressed on, 
gasping out encouraging commands as they struggled to keep up. Winnie tripped and fell, protecting the two she carried as well as she could as she rolled in the snow. She breathed in and out deeply, holding up her hand. Then she coughed, took them up again, and pressed on. A little farther, Lander called. Just a little bit farther. You said that ten minutes ago, Holly said, panting. It's even truer now, he gasped. A shout came from behind, the sound of distant rushing and cries. Lander's heart sank. They found us, Holly screamed. Father will kill us all. Run, Lander cried, forcing his aching legs to go on. An arrow raced between his ears, and he stumbled, almost losing his footing. But he dug in and sprinted ahead, his lungs burning, his legs wobbling, and his heart thumping hard and fast. More arrows, more again. Lander saw it all in moonlit flashes, dark blurry lines against a pale white background, stabbing into snowy ground and sticking suddenly into trees. They will catch us. They will kill them all. I have to slow them down. Can you run a bit now? Lander asked the three little ones he carried. They cried. When I set you down, you must run after the others. Follow Holly. Now. He slowed and set them down while arrows raced overhead. They did rush forward, and he desperately hoped it was fast enough. He spun back, gasping as he unslung his bow. Lander knocked three arrows and fired at the dark forms crashing through the woods in pursuit. He forced his burning arms to reach and clench three more, and fired again as more arrows sank into trees all around him, nipping the fur of his face and splitting the edge of his winter cloak. Now he drew a single shaft, picked his enemy, and sent it crackling at him. The oathbreaker fell with a cry just before an arrow found Lander's leg, spinning him down. He hadn't thought his legs could be in any more pain than they had been. But he was wrong. In agony, he knelt and drew his bow again, determined to take out as many enemies as possible before the end. Knocking his long dart with determination, he scanned the attackers for a likely target, hoping to see Grimble himself. Settling on a forward buck shouting orders and urging the force ahead, Lander squinted. The buck lurched again, staggered, and fell dead. Lander blinked and glanced down at his unshot arrow. Then arrows were flying overhead the other way, and his enemies were spinning down, crying out, and falling back. The trees around Lander burst with loyal bucks, pressing ahead to rescue their prince and cover the escape of the younglings. Lander launched his arrow, adding to the rally, then fell back onto the snow. A medic knelt and assessed his leg. Soon, two strong bucks were hauling him back toward the shore. For a moment, he almost ordered them to set him down. Instinct called him to stay in the fight. But he had learned through many battles that sometimes brave and foolish acts like that got good bucks killed and only satisfied a captain's vanity. He thanked the soldiers bearing him and let them do their job. As they cut through the last row of trees and the shoreline spread out in the moonlight, he saw the last of the little ones being welcomed into a boat. Holly Grimble handed that last little doe in, then carefully stepped in herself as they shoved off. The plan had worked. Grimble's perverse bargain had been undone. The little ones would live. For now, the dragon king Namaz the Destroyer would be livid. Lander was lifted into a boat and joined there by a medic as soldiers surrounded the beach. Your Highness, the medic said, after a more careful examination by torchlight. I think you'll come out of this well. It's lodged deep, sir, but it managed to miss anything that might have killed you. I've cleaned it and will treat it more thoroughly when we get back to camp. If we have time for that, Lander said, gritting his teeth. Seeing the medic's puzzled expression, he continued, I wonder if, 
After years of skirmishes and raids, retaliation, and slow, simmering animosity, we finally tipped the thing into the all-out war we knew would someday come. Aye, the medic said. As your father the king has been saying for years, sir, we must be ready to defend and defend and defend, for the final war will come some day. Lander gazed back toward Grimble Island as their boat rowed for the opposite shore. I think some day might be here.